Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back to our uh, day two uh, keynote of CSVCon. Um, today, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Emily Jacoby. Um, Emily is the executive director and founder of Digital Democracy and is, a, and is passionate about leveraging technology to empower marginalized communities. Beginning her career as a youth journalist at the age of 13, she has led technology, media, and research projects in Latin America, West Africa, Southeast Asia, and the US. Prior to founding Digital Democracy, she worked for Internews Network, allafrica.com, and as Assistant Bureau Director for Y Press. Emily has presided, presented on the intersection of technology, civic engagement, and human rights to US Congress, the State Department, the United Nations, and numerous universities and technology conferences. Devoted to protecting the environment and democratizing the design process at Digital Democracy, Emily works with the staff and board oversees strategic planning and development and, the, and works directly with grassroots partners to design programs and tools that empower marginalized communities to defend their rights. With that, I'd like to introduce and turn it over to Emily. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, hi, everyone. It's really an honor to be here today um, and to be uh, keynoting in a virtual um, space. Um, I've given many kind of, I've done a lot of webinars and everything, but it's my first time really doing a keynote in a virtual conference. So um, it's, yeah, it's an honor to be here and really thanks to all the conference organizers and um, everybody who's put this on. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Let's see, here we go. All right, so let's see. Okay, so yeah, today I wanna to talk about um, data solidarity, which is a phrase we've been tossing around at Digital Democracy. And I'm particularly excited to talk about with all of you, because I think you're gonna have a lot of insight into how you may already be practicing this in your work, in your experiences, and um, how we can do our own like version of it better. Um, but before I wanna do, I wanna begin with something that is really important to me, which is to ground this in place. So of course, we're all here digitally right now, um, but I really wanna start with where we are. Um, so for me, um, if we were actually in person together, um, I actually live in DC, um, I would wanna begin with a land acknowledgement. So DC is, traditionally the territory of Nakachonk and Piscataway people. And because we work with indigenous people, we feel like it's so important to acknowledge the original um, tenders of the land. And though colonization has had a brutal impact and has displaced people, um, we still would acknowledge that where we're starting from. So for you, you know, people are calling in from all sorts of different places. You might be indigenous to the land that you're on right now, or you might be a settler, you might be a visitor, you might be a migrant. Um, but if you could take a minute to think about where you are, and um, let's just have a moment of silence to acknowledge all the traditional peoples who have maintained this beautiful planet for so long. All right, thank you. And I, I included this link um, to native land. If you are not familiar with where you are or, or even places that you might go, um, this is a great resource for finding out who native peoples are to that um, territory. So also talking about where we are right now, um, I wanna talk about where we are emotionally. And I'd love if everybody could take a minute to just send an emoji or a few quick words of where you are and how you're doing. Um, I think there's been a lot of excitement on the Slack and everything for how people are doing right now, which is great. Um, but I had to be honest with you. Um, I felt like I couldn't show up as my full authentic self today if I didn't say that it's been a really hard week for me um, for the past 24 hours or I guess 36 hours, my family was wrestling with whether or not to take my grandmother, who's 98 years old, out of um, the assisted care living facility where she is and whether or not to move her in with my parents. Um, she lives in Indiana, um, where my parents also live, um, which is traditional land of the Miami peoples. And, um, and there's just a coronavirus-related death at her assisted care facility. Um, and 
you know, that's something that I'm working out with my family. I'm sure all of you have your own difficulties and challenges, especially right now. Um, I've, you know, it's been awesome to see uh, Danielle with her kids uh, showing up for the hello intros yesterday. Um, I think there's, you know, just so much that we're all dealing with. And it struck me that how can I talk about data solidarity if we're not acknowledging all the different things that are going on in our lives that we carry with us, you know, into our professional settings and our work settings, and especially right now as those lines are so blurred. Um, yeah, I just really wanted to start by acknowledging that. Um, and for those who maybe had planned to show up at this conference and haven't been able to because of the things they're dealing with, um, just naming all of that. So thank you for also sharing some of your feelings right now. Um, yeah, and please keep it going and thank you. Okay, so the next thing I wanna talk about, oh, we already did that, um, is what brought you here? You know, why are you here? If we were here together, that would be the question I'd wanna be asking all of you. You know, for you, you know, maybe it was a work requirement to come or maybe this just aligns with, you know, the work that you're doing. But what is the deeper reason that brings you here? Maybe it's a commitment to wanting to share information in new ways. Maybe it's, you know, struggles that you had as a younger person or that you've noticed in your community. You know, maybe it's something you're fighting for that you want to see happen better, like, um, like uh, medical information be better shared or something. So again, um, I won't be able to read them all, but I love if people could post a few of your reasons for being here in the chat. Like, I like people, that is such a great answer. Um, keep them coming, we'd love to see more. So for me, what brought me here um, actually started quite a while ago when I was much younger. Um, ironically, I'm currently growing out my bangs because why not during um, uh, coronavirus when I can't leave the house. And I think the last time I was growing out my bangs when I was, when I was 13 years old, so I'm transported back to the awkward state um, as Jonathan shared in my bio, um, I was a youth journalist um, when I was in middle school and high school as part of an amazing program that was dedicated to teaching young people how to, um, how to tell young people's stories through the field of journalism. And so it's been cool within this community to be connected to, to so many journalists um, because I haven't identified as a journalist in a long time. But this, was, uh, this photo was when I was 13 years old and I was, um, through my youth journalism program, we received visas to travel to Cuba. So this is my hometown newspaper, the Indianapolis Star, reporting on the team of us who were going to, um, to Cuba to interview young people. We were hoping to interview Fidel Castro. That didn't happen, um, but we did get to hear him give a speech. And most importantly, I had my eyes completely opened up to, um, to what was happening in the island nation of Cuba, which is you know, one of the United States closest neighbors, but for many United States citizens was at the time and continues to be really inaccessible due to, um, due to embargoes and you know, um, just the hostility between our political, um, you know, our political governments. Um, but what I really learned in Cuba more than anything was how the situation in Cuba and some of the challenges that young people were facing there was linked to policies that my government um, was enforcing. And so that taught me at an early age to try to think about, you know, all the ways in which stories connect us and, and the ways in which human beings, I think, share similar experiences, but the way that government and policies um, and boundaries can cause, car can cause hardships. So fast forward um, about 10 years later, a little bit longer, I was doing research in Southeast Asia with a group that I had um, kind of um, been in university with. And we were um, researching the situation for, for young people um, along the Myanmar-Thailand border. So refugees, um, Burmese refugees, um, and refugees of different uh, various ethnic identity groups. And we were just trying to understand what the situations was for them as refugees and migrant workers. And in our research, we came across a correlation between internet access and political engagement. And that for me was honestly the moment that started me on a path towards becoming a technologist. Because though the, this aspect of internet access seemed so important and so critical to them, and they talked about how, you know, they would walk, um, this young woman, Sulian, she would walk an hour and a half 
in order to get to the internet cafe, in order to communicate with her family members who were in a different refugee camp. And so just this critical, you know, the ability to access information and communicate with their loved ones was so critical. It started me thinking about technology. And over the next couple of years, I did research um, with a couple other people on the ways in which grassroots organizations in Southeast Asia were starting to use technology um, to, to work on human rights issues. So some of them were starting to map um, human rights violations that were happening inside Myanmar, Burma, and they were just trying to share information in, in various ways. And then in fall 2007, September, there was what, what has been referred to as a saffron uprising, um, which is where ordinary um, citizens inside Myanmar, Burma, were fighting against um, a fuel price increase by the government, um, which was a military regime. And they were really just arguing for the basic safety and health of people. And because we had a lot of contacts inside the country, we knew the ways in which they were using mobile phones um, and internet access to share information. And we were actually getting messages from inside the country of what was happening. Um, that Saffron Uprising was halted effectively by the government, um, not, by, um, not, not solely by violence, though there was a violent crackdown um, on the protesters. There, but they actually ended up turning off the internet and cell phones for five full days. And this was in 2007. Um, since then, other governments have done the same. I and mean, we actually right now in Kashmir, I believe it's the longest going um, full internet shutdown, um, which has uh, you know, been, uh, that has been happening while there've been violent repressions against people inside, inside Kashmir. But so in that moment for 2007, for me, it was a total um, aha moment of the power that governments have um, when, when they can shut down technologies and the need to have technologies that aren't dependent on government control and that enable people to actually you know, get the information out in ways that they need to without that kind of interference. So that was really what led to, um, to me co-founding Digital Democracy and, and exploring what, um, how technology itself is a powerful tool and information is a powerful tool and the ways in which the people who are the most marginalized and the most oppressed, how they can leverage that as a tool to fight against the powers that be. Um, I mean, we know that, um, that entrenched powers are always going to try to protect their interests in any way possible. Um, so when we start to um, subvert the, the power and, and make sure that people who are most marginalized have access to it and can actually share their own information and control their own information, that, um, that is how we believe that a lot of positive change can happen. So that's been our focus for a long time at Digital Democracy. And as Jonathan said in my bio, our mission is really just to work in solidarity with marginalized groups to use technology to defend their rights. And that looks a lot of different ways and we've worked in a lot of different places. But the work that I wanna talk about today has been primarily in the Amazon rainforest and with indigenous peoples with whom we've been working for over seven years on a variety of issues. So at Digital Democracy, you know, our day-to-day -day work is really comprised of two things. One, we're working directly with local communities. Um, here, these are a couple of community monitors from, uh, from the um, local group called Eka Amarakari. They are um, an indigenous-led organization that co-manages a natural reserve, a community reserve in Southern Peru, the Amarakari Communal Reserve. And here you see them actually taking a picture of um, a mining site uh, near, near the reserve. And they're documenting all of these threats like mining and illegal logging in order to protect their territory. And we work directly with these groups to help them incorporate technology in a holistic way into, um, into their work to protect their territories. Um, and then we also, as a result, and this is really harkens back, um, I'm gonna be referencing Rudo's talk an hour ago quite a bit. Um, you know, Rudo at the Amazon Conservation Team is doing very aligned work and we've been longtime friends and allies. And so similar to Rudo, we saw in our, in our work with local partners, we've seen such a gap that a lot of the tools 
that um, that are built for commercial reasons or just even for you know the situation here in the United States, for example, where there's a you know not not complete internet access, but certainly more internet access than the Amazon. A lot of those tools just don't work for local partners' needs in the Amazon. And so we the second area of our work, and it's becoming an even bigger area, is to co-create tools with our local partners. Oh, I just accidentally uh, let's see. Sorry, I'm slightly different form than I'm used to. So I'm just um okay. So here's uh here's the just map of some of our partners across the Amazon. These are different indigenous groups that we've been working with, some for you know over a decade, um, many others in the past few years, but I want to give you a sense. Um, there's no groups pictured in Brazil on this map, though we are in relation and starting to work with quite a few work, uh, groups in Brazil as well. Oh, gosh, I did it again. Um, <laughs> Thanks for bearing with me. So the, the the bulk of what I want to talk about is really the story of um, a tool that we've been building called Mapeo. And I'm going to tell it first through telling a story of one of our partners, the Warani people, and how we can co-build this tool together. So this is my friend Namante. She is a, a leader um, of the Warani people who are who live in what is now the eastern part of the Ecuadorian Amazon. And um, the Warani have lived on their territory you know, for thousands upon thousands of years and have very effectively fought against many different ways of invasion. Um, you know, early on Incas, later on the Spanish conquistadors, later on um, ru uh, rubber plantations, um, you know, the list goes on and on. But they have been in contact with the outside world really only since the, the 1980s or so when American missionaries actually came in. And during that first wave of contact, we've been talking a lot about it lately because um, what's happening right now with coronavirus um, is bringing up a lot of the memories of that first wave of contact. Because when the missionaries came in, um, thousands of Warani people um, died from, from common illnesses. Um, and and we've one of the things that the Warani have done is you know map some of the areas where they um, you know where they lost the most people, um, but it, you know in recent years the Warani have um, you know been able to maintain a lot of their traditional ways of li of life um, even amidst kind of contact with the outside world, and they came to us in 2015. Um, through uh, through a couple of our partner organizations, a group called Alianza Sebo, which is an alliance of four different indigenous nationalities in Ecuador, including the Morani, as well as Amazon Frontlines, who are an amazing um, NGO in Ecuador that's working directly with indigenous groups to, um, to build indigenous power. And they asked us to help them with the mapping process. And the mapping process we do is very similar to the one Rudo described, which is we start with paper, um, so here we're uh, here. Namante is actually leading um, a group of women in the village of Nemampare um, to do some some base level mapping. And you can see this is another village. This is from the village of Akaro, um, where they we started with just two butcher blocks sheets. But by the end of the initial paper mapping exercise, they had eight butcher blocks sheets um, put together. And just to give you a sense of how detailed their knowledge is of their community. Um, the you know the the village itself took up about this much. It's hard to see on my kind of screen. Um, about this much of a paper. It wasn't that big, but their deep knowledge of all of the rivers and streams. You know, they just wanted to keep going out and out. So we start with paper maps um, because that's very accessible and means that everybody can get involved. And then they would go out, and at the time they were using GPS handhelds to go out and document places, often with elders, and they would do oral history interviews, again, similar to Rudo's work with elders of, um, of you know, the different things and sites that they were documenting. And then they would come back, and this is, this is kind of the part um, that we were really excited about is we were building at the time the early version of what we now call Mapbeo desktop, um, which is a desktop-based application that our partners had on their on their computers, were able to take into the field, and then in real time they would actually hook them up to a projector, 
project against the wall and have the whole community get to be part of the process of digitizing the data that they had collected and um, and be able to put in wow tarot their you know their own language all of the details about what was going on and so map Bayo is a, um, a tool that we've built um, we originally built it on top of OpenStreetMap's ID editor, but instead of the back end being the OpenStreet global uh, Street Map global database, which of course is online, they have an offline version that's just theirs. Um, and so we built it so that it's offline first. So as you can see here, this is Jorge, who was a member of the Morani mapping team, talking with an elder, and they were able to look at the map together and really, you know, be involved in that not just the paper process but the digital process. So here's a close-up of one of the communities that they mapped, Diamond Taro. And then here are just a few of the um, dozens and upon dozens of icons that they created over time. And this process was, was a really cool process where the communities would you know, first have a physical brainstorm of what are the, what are the things we want to document, and then they would kind of categorize those and then they would do drawings of these and then they worked with an Ecuadorian uh, Quito-based designer to turn them into digital icons that they could put in. Um, and so these maps, you know, were really first, first and foremost created for the communities themselves and they were sharing them amongst their communities. And then um, two years ago, the government announced this is a map of the Ecuadorian Amazon with the, you know, the yellow centered on Morani territory. The government announced a sale of a lot of new oil blocks, including Block 22, which is right here in the kind of um, western part of Warani territory. And Block 22 is actually where we had been doing that mapping. So Nimampare, Damantaro, Akaro, some of these villages I mentioned were all are all in Block 22. And the government announced that they were going to um, to be leasing these blocks for sale, and they were basing it off of you know consultations that they claim to have done with um, with local communities. Um, the problem is that, you know, when they did those consultations, they really just flew in, talked to a couple people, said, we want to, you know, help you build schools, we want to help you build hospitals, um, and then can you sign this? And a couple people signed it out, uh, signed that, but there really wasn't, you know, any actual full consultation process, and most people had no idea what they were agreeing to. So the Warani launched, um, they, they launched a campaign to fight against that. This is actually a screenshot from a map we helped them build, a map story, which I'll link to um, later, which tells the whole story of their fight against oil and the, and the threats that the oil posed for them. And then they also launched a, uh, an online version of their map. Um, and they this was again from the same map story that we helped them build that really tells the story of why their um, their territory is so threatened by oil and why they're resisting oil drilling on their territory. Um, one of the things that they told us in the early stages that has just always stuck with me is we want to create a map full of things that don't have a price. Um, so they saw the way in which oil drilling has come into neighboring communities and just devastated the local environment. It's made people dependent on outside um, food and water, you know, it's it's stopped them from being able to hunt and fish, and it's forced them into a dependency on the national government that the Warani otherwise don't have. So we launched this campaign, and the like the advocacy side went along with the legal side, and the legal strategy has been really critical. And here you see Namante, who was in that first picture I shared, of um, you know of the the mapping. Uh, the mapping workshop, and here she is um, one of the lead plaintiffs in the legal case. And um, the case was first heard by the local courts, and then it was, um, and then it went on to the national level. And each time, the Ecuadorian government ruled um, in, in the Warani's favor and said that the the Ecuadorian government had indeed um, violated their rights to free, prior, and informed consent. So, free, prior, and informed consent being a really critical piece of of kind of the indigenous. Um, the, the UN Declaration of Indigenous Rights, and it enabled them to, to have the oil block removed from their territory. So and in effect, that court case meant that one ha a half million acres of the Warani, um, you know, Ecuadorian Amazon has been protected. And now we're working with those same partners to work on a larger project um, around all the other territories that were also um, up for sale in that oil block, which as you can see is um, 7 million acres. 
um, that those are now also being questioned as to the legality of them. So that was really exciting to see. And, you know, Mapbeo was just a really a tool in the background that um, that enabled, you know, this community to create their own map and in doing so not only have tools that they could use in court to argue why, you know, their territory would be so threatened by oil, but it also enabled them to actually just build up shared unity that that they talked a lot and that we debriefed about the whole process and they talked a lot about how the mapping process for them felt critical to then building the consensus they needed to to fight against the oil when it was announced. Um, so here's another story. This is um, Alexandra, who's um, one of the members of the Guardia, which is uh, like a local patrol of the Kofan people in Sinangue. And um, they're also a member of Alianza Sebo. And we started working with them um, about the, for the Warani mapping process, we really used the you know, handheld GPSs and the desktop application. Um, but through that process, we we were starting to see, and with many of our different partners, the need for a better mobile phone application. Um, Rudo actually mentioned some of the tools that you know we've used in the past, like Open Open Data Kit, and others. And you know, there's a lot of tools out there that are designed to help collect data offline, but there are very few tools we've found that take that data collection and turn it into locally empowered data management. So, you know, a lot of times when people are, when, whether it's indigenous people, you know, whether it's rural villagers, um, you know, maybe for an academic study, when people are kind of conscripted to help collect data, it often feels actually like a very extractive process because, um, I mean, I've talked to people in so many different places who have been part of data collection efforts where they've maybe been trained in how to use a phone and go out and ask questions and gather information, and then they never see that data again. And that for us is deeply problematic. So the idea behind MapBio Mobile is not only that it would be easy to collect data in the field, you know, in these remote areas without internet, but that they could also then manage the information themselves. So we worked with Alexandra and her community and we built this tool. Um, this is a screenshot of the kind of um, uh, GPS view. And you can see some of the different points that have been taken along the way. And you are kind of just, you know, very visual and um, simple to do. You press this orange button to take um, to take a picture, or sorry, to take, to take a GPS point. Um, oh, gosh, I did it again. Uh, <laughs> Um, usually don't make so many tech mistakes, but this is a new system for me. Um, and then, so you, you press that first button and then you are able to choose, you know, different, these are, um, we have permission to share these images of some of the different icons that they've been collecting um, in Sinangue, um, like trees, um, like different kinds of palms, uh, you know, ants and so on, um, or, and let me just go back um, did it again. sorry um, wow so you can also take you can also switch to camera view up here uh, or you can look at all of the, the items you've collected here. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of screenshots on this because I didn't want to get too technical in this, but if you do want to learn more, um, you can go to our website. I think Ruder actually already posted the MapAO link and you can see a lot more um, images of this. And then this is um, just actually a, a short video this, that one of my colleagues took while in The Hague um, of how you can, how you can use um, MapAO very easily so you can see the different kinds of categories you know we we work with partners to create their own categories or their standard sets people can um, download you can enter in information it's also designed that you don't have to enter information um, so sometimes you know somebody just needs to really quickly take a picture that's connected to gps points and get out of there if it's a dangerous situation for example and so we've built in a lot of flexibility to that um, to how MapBeo works so that it can meet different different needs, um, as well as different like permissions and privacy controls. So here's another picture. Um, some of Alexandra's colleagues from the, the Sinangue Guardia, um, the patrol out doing, doing a mapping um, project. So what MapBeo Mobile does um, 
is allows for both taking baseline map information, um, like you know sacred sites or where different rivers are, where community sites are, where plants and animals are, but it also allows for tracking ongoing monitoring information. So where an oil spill maybe has happened or illegal logging or mining. And so we're working with partners um, in many different places who are working across many different examples. Um, right now it's being used by over 150 different frontline defenders. Um, who are representing like 7,000 people in total, um, and they're monitoring and mapping territory um, of size of about 4 million hectares, um, which is uh, close to 10 million acres um, of indigenous territory. Right now it's primarily being used in the Amazon, um, but we are starting to work, it's being used as well um, in, in Central America, and we're starting to work with some groups in Southeast Asia who are translating it into different languages which I'll get into in a minute. Um, so our vision for it really is that because we built it to be offline first and to um, to be used and adapted to different use cases, our vision is to you know continue making it available to people anywhere who might need it. And if you have any you know potential case study ideas or groups that you think might want to use it, we'd love to hear about that. So. All of that um, kind of brings me to the topic of our talk, which is around data solidarity. Again, I don't even know if that's a phrase that works. I'm just kind of trying it out, and I really would welcome feedback on that. Um, but for me, solidarity is really around recognizing that we're all interconnected. And um, you know, power imbalances exist, um, systems of oppression exist all too well. And yet when we start to recognize um, that we're all interconnected and that we all stand to benefit from supporting one, each, one another, then we can start to act, I think, in solidarity with each other. And for us, you know, there's a few different ways we do that. And I really was trying to think of how do I share this in a way that can be relevant? You know, my, like on the surface, doing indigenous mapping in remote parts of the Amazon may seem really different than running a library. Um, and on the other hand, I think there are so many similarities because we're all working you know, to try to benefit the common good. We're working around issues of how do we address different imbalances and try to you know, make things better with information and data we share. So yeah, really, I'm really interested in like what aspects of things we've learned can be relevant to to you. So one thing we, we've become really clear on is that we think we are, um, oh my gosh, I'm just seeing the the comment about the system glitch. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so uh, we have realized, I'll admit, when I first started digital democracy, I thought that maybe technology was just neutral and it's all about how people use it. Um, you know, there's lots of kind of sayings like that um, in the United States about different things. Um, and like, for example, if I think if a somewhat famous one is, well, it's not guns that kill people, it's people who kill people. And, you know, technically that's true. And yet also the things that we build are imbued with different values. And so often, I mean, for too much of human history, the people who have the most power have claimed to be neutral and have claimed to be objective um, and have you used that kind of veil of objectivity to actually enforce a lot of terrible policies that have hurt many, many people. And so we became, as we started building our own technology, we realized that we really needed to name our values and then we needed to constantly check if the decisions we were making were in line with those values because especially in an era when so much technology is built um, by for-profit companies um, and not only for-profit but that you know are built into a system based on you know return um, of capital to venture capitalists and and are built into um you know, a system where like for many, for many of this like social media tools that we use, you know, our, our information, our attention is actually the product and that's being monetized, but often in such an invisible way. So for us, we felt like, um, uh, we felt like it was really important to name our values and, and lead with those. And I think it's something that, you know, everybody working with data um, and information technology should be doing. So some of our values are, if I get this right. So first, self-determination and autonomy, um, especially because we're working with indigenous peoples, it's so critical to make sure that they 
are able to make decisions for themselves. So with our technology work, we're trying to reduce dependency on outsiders. We're trying to um, be sure that they're able to actually control their own information and choose you know, how and when it's shared. Next is accessibility. Um, you know, this is obviously critical and you know, something we've already been talking about so much these past few days at this conference, um, but all the different ways in which accessibility matters. So looking at, you know, especially with indigenous peoples, we're working on a lot of different languages, also around, you know, just understanding, you know, what what to me brought up in the visual way I was might be, you know, really obvious is gonna be different to somebody from a different culture. So how do how are we testing? Um, and kind of working with, with our partners to design things that really work for them from the get-go. Next is collaboration. Um, you know, everything we do is in partnership. And I think, I think the funding model of so many things, I was thinking about this with, with CC's comment yesterday around, um, you know, uh, how journal how there's collaboration on the tech within journalism but competition elsewhere and i think that's not so dissimilar probably from ngos and from uh from academia and i i think at least in the ngo sector i really want to change that i think that um the more we collaborate the better you know we're not we have the benefit of we're not working for just a financial bottom line we're working for a human bottom line so the more we actually are collaborating and sharing um sharing our work and sharing sharing um, our approaches, I think the greater impact we can have. Uh, and then finally, our, our final value that was kind of one of our guiding stars is just the integration of social and environmental justice. Um, and, and again, in the NGO sector, I think there's so much push to kind of separate those two things out as though, you know, what happens to people over here and what happens to the environment over here are really separate things. But we believe that those just cannot be separated and especially, um, today in an era of, you know, with the threats of, you know, changing climate and everything else, we really have to look at those things as linked. And, um, you know, we're not gonna be doing anything good for the environment if we're harming indigenous peoples um, along the way and vice versa. So, yeah, you know, based on that, I wanted to talk about some of the ideas of like, some of the ideas that we've been working on that might apply to the broader um, CSV community. And I'm excited to see, you know, your thoughts. Um, and and please feel free to like add to the chat as well and communicate afterward. Um, but one thing we've been really talking about a lot is local first. So um, Ruta was talking about offline first um, and how critical that is. So for us, local first means not only that things are built to work offline first. Um, from the get-go, but also that all the data can be stored locally, um, and that information can all be can all be shared there. And so we've we've written a we've written a blog post about this. Would love to get your thoughts on it. Um, but for us, if things work offline and then can go online, then we know that they can reach everybody. Um, so it's, that's again about the kind of accessibility issue. Second. We think a lot about community-owned data um, and not necessarily open by default. Um, I know a lot of folks in this community are doing really important work around um, open data. And I think that's so critical when we think about governments, um, when we think about oil companies, when we think about mining companies, you know, basically anywhere where the power um, is held, you know, like where there are power imbalances, I think opening up data is, is really important because Often it's through closed data sets that um, that entrenched power interests are able to maintain those interests um, and are able to you know uh, really continue harming people. But sometimes I think uh, it's also important to understand again around power imbalances for indigenous peoples. You know sometimes um, opening data can be the worst um, option for them. You know one example that really sticks with me is during the fight over um, the Dakota Access Pipeline in 2016, the, um, the, uh, the tribe put in a, um, information to the local government office about where some sacred sites were because they wanted to make sure those sites were protected um, from the pipeline that was coming through. And that day, and of course, this was in, in, in the time when there were many, you know, so many nonviolent protesters who come to um, come to the the camp, and we're trying to you know support the tribe's sovereignty around preventing the um, the pipeline from coming through. 
the um, the pipeline company jumped ahead in their construction process. So the, the information was filed with the local government on a Friday. The following day on a Saturday morning, the pipeline company jumped ahead 20 miles in order to, to actually start construction exactly where these sacred sites were um, because they would rather pay the fine for, you know, for violating that than have them being halted from, from building the pipeline. And, you know, there's, there's many examples like that of ways in which, you know, really important sensitive information um, from indigenous communities has been, if it's shared, has then been linked and turned against them. So, so for us, we talk a lot about community owned data um, because sometimes open isn't the right answer, especially when, you know, we're dealing with marginalized communities and sensitive information. Um, and then, you know, I've already kind of mentioned this, but co-designing and co-building from the beginning, um, just seen so many examples in our work around the world of really well-intentioned projects that have been built from far away and then brought to a community. And, you know, the good, all the good intentions in the world don't matter if people aren't kind of, you know, listened to from the get-go. Um, and I think that it really, especially when we think about the resources it takes to build new projects and to and to deal with, you know, new data projects, um, you know, having things come from the local community is always the best practice. And then finally, taking a stance. Um, I think that, you know, this is something we're, we're, we've been talking about with, with just naming our values and, um, you know, maybe it feels a little risky, like maybe we're going to get something wrong. Maybe we're going to realize some of the things we're doing aren't in line with our values, but we think it's really important to, to take a stance and to, to name what we're going for and what we're working for, um, because it helps us like learn in the open, um, helps us find the people that, that we're meant to collaborate with and, um, and hopefully helps all of our work be better. So that I believe is just about what I wanted to say. Um, some ways you can get involved, and I'll post these links in Slack as well. Um, if you want to get involved in contributing to our code, we would love that. We have lots of different, um, you know, ways to get involved, and lots of different um, repositories you can you can contribute to. Especially if you um, know React Native, um, which is a, the kind of core tool um, we've used to to enable our um, our apps to work across different platforms. And then we also have been doing a lot around translation. I meant to include a slide of all the different language uh, languages that MapAO is being translated into, um, but you are welcome to contribute. If you click on those links, you'll see some of the, um, the languages that it's being translated into. And, and then I'll um, also include our public Slack link um, in this chat and in Slack. And I think I'm good to go for questions. Thank you, Emily. Um, I think we have plenty of time for questions, so I hope that people um, will add their questions to um, the chat or the ask your question feature. Um, additionally, I just wanted to say, while we kind of wait for questions to come in a little bit, say thank you very much for um, your, 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 your keynote address and the way you started the keynote. Um, at least I'll speak for myself, it um, really put me in a mindset to receive the, the topic that mm -hmm. you were discussing. It's a, it was a very um, uh, appropriate setting and mind frame uh, to receive this really important discussion. So with that, I, I wanna move to the questions that I see in the questions. And the first one I wanna ask is um, from at Fubits, and, uh, can you share with us how much funding, time, and personnel it took to build the app and the ecosystem? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's hard to say because if we built that, I don't know what, what the amount would be if we built just the app, um, because in a way we couldn't have ever built just the app because it. I, I think we would have built a pretty you know, un, like not very useful app if we had just built it um, separate from the work we're doing with our partners. Um, I will say it's been, it's we started building the early prototypes of MapAO uh, in 2014, 2015. So it's been, you know, five or six years. Um, we've had 
uh, we've been building off, I should have mentioned this earlier, um, Again, it's, it's been a hard day for me and um, so <laughs> not been my most coherent self, um, which hopefully just gives permission to all of us to not always be our most coherent selves. Um, we have been, we built off a lot of open source tools that we've been building off of um, like DAP project, um, which is uh, running a lot of the kind of the, running the core script underneath, um, which uh, Mapeo is, is built as a distributed app with peer-to-peer um, -peer sharing. So, we have had two to three people working on the, the core technology for the past three years. Um, I, I guess I'd say probably if we're thinking just about the technology up until now, it's probably around half a million dollars um, to build. Uh, but it wasn't just like Mapeo mobile and Mapeo desktop that we've built with that. Um, it's also our, our our technology team also does a lot of kind of customization of different tools for our partners. Um, so yeah, I'd say five or six years, half a million dollars, um, two to three people over the, like, depending on the time period over that time. Um, but it's actually been so much more than that. Like we have a whole program team that, you know, are, are kind of constantly in contact with our partners and doing the trainings and workshops that have informed the process, but the core, the core technology, that's that's my best guess answer. That's a great answer. Um, another question from the 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 chat. Um, how is co-creation work being affected by the pandemic? Yeah. Um, well, first I'll just say Indigenous people are being deeply affected by the pandemic, and if you have. Uh, if you have extra capacity to give, um, I'll also post a couple of links um, to some some fundraisers that are going on. Um, it, people are being deeply affected and all travel, of course, has halted um, uh, internationally, but even within countries. So early on, a lot of our partners had to make a decision um, whether they were gonna go you know, back into their territories, if they have territories where you know that they have control over. Many people have retreated into their territories. And for those who still have, you know, um, food sovereignty and like clean water, they're doing okay and they're able to just kind of shut away for a while. Um, for communities that have been affected by oil drilling and by logging and mining, um, they are often dependent on outsider, you know, outside access for clean water, for food, for everything. And so uh, we're seeing coronavirus hitting a lot of those communities. And even our partners that are based um, in country, like in Peru and Ecuador, aren't able to travel right now. So um, we are, certainly a lot of our things are on hold. We, one of my, my colleagues was supposed to be in Peru right now doing a two week workshop um, that has been put on hold. However, many of our partners that are dealing with the most urgent threats, like the mining and logging, they're based in like border communities where they have internet access. So we've been able to stay in communication with them. And we're doing some adjustments like um, Mapeo allows for exporting data through like WhatsApp or other you know, apps on your phone. And so some of the people who are kind of separated by each, from each other physically are still able to communicate if they have minimal access um, over, um, you know, over, over basic cell phone connections. So uh, our to-do list is actually so long that we, even if we had no contact with our partners, you know, they've already given us, us enough things to do that we we would probably keep busy for the next half a year. Um, so we're just kind of playing it by ear, and we're doing we're doing some more webinars now for for kind of intermediary partners um, to get them trained up in Mapeo, so that once uh, you know once travel domestically is able to happen again that they can go and do more trainings um, in in remote areas that currently you can't visit um, so I will point out in the chat it looks like um, people are really engaging with that the concept and putting um, links in and from another uh, question for the chat, and I think this was to the, the general chat, but uh, I think it's fair to, to ask you as well, is um, can you recommend some readings on uh, this topic, data solidarity, sovereignty, but on this um, collective societal level? Yeah, um, I will send some. We're actually producing some right now. Uh, we've been doing a Q&A series with some practitioners, and there's there's a couple things we'll be putting out really soon with some amazing insights from 
like um, a woman uh, who I just interviewed um, recently named uh, Piru Chung, who's based um, in Southeast Asia and doing a lot of uh, indigenous data um, uh, sovereignty with um, with indigenous groups across Southeast Asia. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll put some links and then, yeah, we'll be doing more. Um, Rudo mentioned this on his talk, um, the concept of, uh, of indigenous data sovereignty, I think is really critical. So, um, and and I'm st we're still trying to figure out kind of how that applies to individuals or, you know, non-indigenous groups. And that's kind of where our framing around data solidarity has come up because while an indigenous nation should of course be able to have sovereignty over their own data, you know, how that applies to maybe more of a community group or, you know, different groups who, are, who don't have as strong of a, you know, national identity. Um, I think uh, is a really interesting topic. So I'll include some links like that. Um, one thing to note that comes to mind, uh, for example, somebody mentioned, I think in Rudo's talk that Rudo was talking about, you know, the good Amazon. Um, Amazon.com actually has been engaged in a multi-year fight uh, to take the domain .amazon um, and to have that be, you know, be theirs. And I, I believe it's been in a long process with the different um, international like governing bodies. Um, but for me, that's a great example of like uh, data colonialism or, you know, just tech, tech colonialism to, to, to have the arrogance to say, you know, there's a whole, there's a whole region of the world with multiple countries spanning it that spans the Amazon and that we can instead have that like domain, um, that domain name. Um, so that's that's something that um, the Peruvian and Brazilian governments were fighting, um, but I believe that the latest news is that they lost that fight. So I'll also send a link to that because I think it's something that most people don't know about, and that is a great example of just uh, how many ways I think corporate technology has just colonized even you know even our digital spaces. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, oh, uh, a new question from the chat. Uh, as technology advances exponentially every day, where do you see the future of data solidarity and protecting our marginalized communities in five and 15 years? I think we're going to see, and of course this is a totally biased answer because this is what we're working on, but I believe we're gonna see more and more offline first initiatives because as we recognize, you know, during natural disasters, what happens? Well, the internet often goes out. Um, you know, during during crises, um, you know, like what's happening right now with coronavirus, there's information that communities need to share, and they often need to share, you know, in ways that are protecting private information, and they need to share it quickly. And so, if we build tools that allow for decentralization um, and allow for information to be shared amongst trusted pods and networks, um, then we're building tools that. that that can that can meet those needs. Um, so I hope I hope that we see more of a reclaiming of the internet and of you know spaces for sharing from from the kind of centralized walled gardens that we currently have online into more decentralized spaces that are run by different communities. Um, and I I hope that you know part of what's been challenging about building Mapbeo is that we're still kind of doing a lot of somewhat cutting edge things in terms of. Um, a peer-to-peer -peer database and decentralized sharing and so on. Um, but I think as as more people work on on that and recognize the importance, I mean, it's, you know, we're seeing in um, in academia like you know amazing work of people trying to to share share information that is decentralized. So that's one of the things I hope we see. Um, I also think, again, this is the optimistic side. I really hope we'll see more and more tools being built by the communities. Um, that are using them. So we'll see less of the innovation coming from, from Silicon Valley, or we'll recognize more of the innovation that's not just coming from Silicon Valley. You know, I'm thinking about uh, Rhizomatica based in Oaxaca, where they've been building their own um, cell phone networks. Um, you know, there, there's just, there's a lot of examples um, around the world of, of people creating technology, you know, for themselves. And, and I hope we'll, we'll see you know, more of that in the next 10 to 15 years. Thank you. Um, I'm just looking through uh, the chats and the questions. It looks like they've slowed down a little bit, but it seems to be a really active discussion based on um, 
your 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 thoughts, your presentation, and, and comments. I appreciate that. We have a couple minutes left uh, for questions. If anyone wants to to get um, submit a question. So, um, not seeing anything. I had I had a question earlier, and I think you started to, uh, or you you spoke about it a little bit uh, about um, how the the technologies and these methodologies might be deployed in um, places that have less recognized. Um, um, less recognized cohesive communities. Um, and I'm thinking oh, a lot about like um, communities that have been established over the last 100, 200 years, 300 years are now being distributed through external uh, forces. Mm. Have people been thinking about how to apply either these methodologies or even the tools that you've developed in these communities? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. So we we pretty much only work with people who kind of come to us. Um, so we're not actively like out kind of evangelizing um, necessarily uh, or trying to get people to adapt our tool because um, we're just kind of not interested in that. But that being said, um, I mean, we are having lots of different groups come to us for different reasons or people see, you know, learn about Mapbeo in some way, like, you know, maybe through this presentation and are like, oh, you know, that's interesting. Maybe we could apply it to this. So um, I do think, I mean, we knew from the get go that we had to design it to be offline and local first for our partners to use it. Um, but our hunch has always been that it, because it um, it allows for communities to control the information themselves and then choose how and when and have the power to share that outward, that it will be useful to other groups. And, and so I think um, I think we will see more and more of that. I mean, our, our hope is just to make make it available and to hopefully be able to, to make whatever changes communities might request. So for example, a lot of our current partners are very cohesive. And so they're able, right now the peer-to-peer -peer database is like automatically share everything within a network of trust. And then you choose what you're gonna export out. But for other communities, they may need to, you know, th they don't have that full trust yet. And so because of colonization and because of all these different forces that, you know, the impact community trust, they may need to have different sharing settings just within the app, not just for export. Um, so that's something we're working on currently, like a kind of levels of, of kind of trust within the app. Um, so, uh, yeah, right now, I mean, like I said, we've had we've had some different groups coming to us, and and I think we will see more who are adapting it to not just environmental data, but it could be people. Some some groups are adapting it to to you know coronavirus related information right now, and to it could be a whole host of different issues. Thank you. Um, I I think we are officially at time, so um, with that, I wanted. To to say thank you, thank you again for your presentation and for answering all the questions and the conversation that you, you started. Uh, Thanks so much, start. Jonathan, and thank you everybody for your kind words in the chat. It's really sweet way to get feedback. <laughs> and so, folks who um, had questions that we didn't get to, uh, of course, we'll move them over to the Slack Q and A CSV uh, Q and A, and then. Um, with that, I think I'll, if I could, I'll just uh, do a little bit of house cleaning and uh, housekeeping. That's the phrase. Okay, I'll sign off. Thank you. All right, thank you. And uh, say that coming up now is um, Llama Brunch Lunch Munch. Um, and uh, there are going to be, there are, uh, Zoom rooms that have been posted in the uh, the Slack uh, sort of bird of a feather style, so uh, folks can follow up with those if they're interested. And um, uh, thank you, everyone who attended, and I will uh, sign off. But uh, remember, the llama brunches at at the half hour, and you can find that on the schedule as well. <laughs>